Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, this is O-Culture, where we transmit conversations on esoteric art, science, and history at 528 hertz. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. You picked a good time to drop by this little cupboard under the stairs because woo-woo adventurer Tommy Kelly is in the house. Tommy's coming up in just a moment. But first, I have to shout out the thousands of you who downloaded episode 29 with Dan Willis. You made that our most downloaded episode yet. Much appreciated. If you dug that episode and came back, we do have a footnote to that episode coming up in a couple of weeks, so stay tuned for that. And if you want to hear more like that, longer episodes and more often, please do consider supporting the show monthly or with a one-time donation. Check out oculturepodcast.com slash support for more info on that, or click open the show notes for the link. All right, so Tommy Kelly is an Irish writer, artist, and chaos magician, and he's the magical mind behind the blog Adventures in Woo Woo, where he discusses and investigates many topics related to the occult and spirituality. Tommy has recently released a project called The 40 Servants, A Magic System and Divination Deck. He's also the author of Them, a graphic novel that doubles as a hyper sigil. And he's recently launched the Tommy Kelly podcast available on iTunes and SoundCloud. If you're new to magic or on the fence about magic, this will hopefully resonate with you and urge you in the right direction. I know it encouraged me to delve more into the subject and the practice. Either way, I hope you enjoy the conversation. So let's get this woo-woo adventure started. I'll see you on the other side. Tommy Kelly, welcome to O'Culture, man. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Great to have you, man. First things first, Adventures in Woo Woo, hands down, best blog name I've come across. And that's, oh, thank you very much. Yeah, that's not to slight the content on there, but that name, I love that name so much. But before we get into your writing and your work, let's talk about where Tommy Kelly's Woo Woo adventure began. At what point in your life did you discover this magical world that you now inhabit? Uh, oh, yeah, that's a good question. I suppose... Um... I remember when I was a kid and I was very young, I used to think I had magic powers and not in the kind of wizardy magic powers. I used to think I could affect electricity and, um, you know, I could fix things with my mind, which I thought was a bit weird. But it was was like my mom used to get worried about it. She told me years later because she thought like I would be going around getting into danger, thinking I could, you know, fix these things. So that I don't know if if that's something everyone thinks. I'm sure there's an element of it to to most kids when they're young to think that, you know, they have that kind of... uh, feeling that they're magic and it's kind of something that you 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 lose as you get older you know yeah but then later i suppose when i was a bit maybe a young teenager maybe not just quite a teenager i used my my auntie um she lived in london and she would come home uh, a couple of times a year and you know she'd come visit or whatever and she was really interested in all of these sort of like uh, theosophy and blavatsky and alice bailey and stuff like that and i would just be fascinated by it and you know and trying to find out, talk to her more about it and, you know, kind of drive everyone mad just talking about these things. So I just thought it absolutely fascinating. So even at that kind of age, I was very interested in what was going on. What what is this all about? What's, you know, why are we here? All of those questions, you know. And then I would have come across a a guy called Stuart Wilde, which I don't know. A lot of people don't know who he is, but he was a huge kind of new age guy in the 80s and the 90s, but like massive, like really well known. And he had a couple of books called uh, The Force and The Quickening. And he had another one called Miracles, which was quite popular. It's a really thin book, which was basically uh, the law of attraction in a different, you know, the secret. It was kind of like the 80s version of that. But his other books had a bit more, you know, substance to them or whatever. So I get that. He would he'd be on about meditation and listening to Tita Metronome tapes and kind of you know, bring in the brain wave, the brain, or your, you know, what is it like? Your, your trance, getting into a trance state. And he says, eventually, that after he got into a trance state, I, with his eyes open, he started seeing like the near death tubes, the things that people talk about when they have near death experiences. And he started uh, finding ways to travel through these and get into different worlds and that. And just, just fascinated me. And I thought it was amazing. You know, just because like this is, this is the type of stuff I want to get into. But you know, you're a teenager and then you find out that, uh, Playing guitar probably gets you more interest from uh, girls than uh, talking about meditation and uh, (laughs) weird stuff. So I kind of, not that I kind of, it went to the back of my mind for a while in that. It's just because one of the issues I've kind of had is that I've never met anyone else really who's into any of this in in real life. Like I've never met a case magician in real life. 
I've met I've met a Wiccan once, and I hung around with some druids for a while. But most people I know don't aren't into any of this, so it's not something that's ever really. Not that it's hidden or kind of, it's just not something people are interested in at all. Like all of my friends are atheists completely. Like there's, there's like in Ireland is like as much as it's like a really considered Catholic country, it's mostly an atheist secular country in my generation and, and especially more in like the, the next generation coming up. So there, it's like when you're in that kind of a void, you can't, you know, how do you, how do you kind of develop that interest? You just kind of, it just kind of moves along. And I found that when I was like, say, 18 or 19 and I was reading, I started getting into like Buddhism and that sort of thing, just because that was all that was available. Like if you went to a bookshop, you weren't getting any magic books. You you weren't getting, I didn't even know Chaos Magic existed at all because how could I? There was no internet, there was no books, there was no telling me about it. So it was just, you kind of had to go with what was there. And uh, most of that was like new age stuff. So I spent a lot of time looking at new age stuff just because that was the only avenue I had. But, you know, you still had people like Alan Watts and people like Blavatsky, who was, you know, all that Ascended Master stuff and all that. And none of it really kind of, it was interesting because I was interested in the topic and in the area and I'm looking for answers and stuff. But none of it ever satisfied what I wanted. You know, it's not that I, was, I never went, oh, this is, you know, this is what it's all about. This is it. So then in my kind of mid-20s, I was, I was in bands and I was um, being a sound engineer and, you know, wanted to be a rock star, all that kind of stuff. And I'd been pursuing that. And I, because of the, with the nature of doing music, if you only ever, like you're doing Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you're playing or you're gigging or whatever. So you have all this time, free time during the week. So I decided that I, I'd go to college and do something, you know, or go and do a course or whatever, just to fill up my time. And the course I did was holistic health studies. And so I learned all about, it was a two-year course, and it was like you learned aromatherapy, Reiki, reflexology, massage, alternative medicine, Indian head massage, all of this kind of stuff. And I've got like this, you know, I'll meet some people who are into this kind of thing, you know, like I'll, I'll, and it was all, a lot of the pe- girls and uh, it was mostly, it was all women apart from me and one other guy. And they were all like, a lot of them were coming just from like beauty therapy kind of thing who wanted to add in aromatherapy and reflexology as part of uh, their beauty therapy sort of regimen or whatever. So not there was no kind of spiritual element to most of the people who were there. And there was one uh, girl and she was the Wiccan and um, that was the Wiccan who had met. And she was kind of, I was going kind to of be asking her, like, what do you do? Like, what is it? And it's like as if she didn't really do anything, just kind of, which is, sounds like I'm being quite hard on her, because, but she was cool. She, I really liked her, but it was like she didn't do anything. You know, so it was just like somehow she defined herself. She wasn't, she wasn't doing magic. She wasn't doing meditation. She wasn't, it was just... That's what she felt, she, you know, her calling was what I was kind of going like, but what does that look like day to day? And it didn't look any different from anyone else's day to day, you know, not that she or her should have been all, you know, witches or all black or all that thing. But it's just I was like, on, but what, what use is it to you then? Mm-hmm. And then. The Reiki thing, the Reiki, how familiar are you with Reiki? I assume everyone kind of knows what it is at this point. Yeah, and oh. I've actually had it performed on me, so I'm, yeah. I'm pretty familiar with it. The thing about it was my Reiki teacher was like everyone who's doing this course, apart from a few were like they were, it was an adult course. Like they were in their 20s at minimum. I was about 25, 26. When I did it. And then there was a whole lot of other ones who were like late 30s, 40s and then into their 50s. So it was a definitely adult education kind of thing. The Reiki one was the one that felt most like school. Like she was very authoritarian, very angry, very um, dismissive and, you know, very pushy. And I was going, wow, is this what she learned from doing Reiki? You know, it's just the, the learning, you know, is that what, it, you know, you end up becoming or, you know, if, if it's not even helping her to be kind of a any sort of a, a better person, then, you know, what what kind of use it in, in, in many ways. And I find that an awful lot with, with things like it, which um, later on I got into um, when I got into tarot and stuff. I joined Builders of the Adidom, which is a BOTA, which is kind of like a. Or oh, mystery school through the posts that teaches you how to use tarot. And it's great. It's like, it's, you know, if you want to learn tarot, it's a great route to go down. Going into the groups and the forums and stuff like that, all the people were just so assholic, you know, like really, like people who had, you know, spent 20 years with this stuff and really had chips on the shoulder, really nasty, looked down on people. And I was kind of like, what, you know, how, what good is this stuff then to people if you're not becoming a better 
person out of it or, you know. So it kind of, at that point, I got a bit disillusioned with the whole thing um, because I, I was just, I couldn't see a point to it in that the, the Reiki, while it seemed to do something, I don't think it was what people were saying it was. And I, I didn't agree with the whole, you're not allowed to talk about it, you know, like there was, because there's like 20 million different types of Reiki and you have to get initiated into each one. And if you're not initiated in this one, you have to, you know, you can't talk to anyone else about it. You can't share your your symbols, whatever. And there's people in, in the class that, was, that I did my Reiki with who wouldn't talk about stuff they knew about Reiki because they uh, had learned it somewhere else. And it basically came down to they wouldn't tell me because I hadn't paid the money. And that was it. And I was kind of going, that's very suspect. You know, like if it's this universal energy or whatever, then share it. Like it's if or if it's not meant to be shared to say mundane or profane day to day life, whatever. I'm in a situation where we're all learning this thing and you still won't share it. So that thing of going and learning how to uh, do Reiki over a weekend and you pay 800 to or thousands, depending on who you're going with. Just that I just felt something very off putting about it. Again, I think you should be allowed charge for whatever you're doing but i don't there's just something that didn't sit right right with me so after that i spent a few yeah that was coming up that then after i left that course at that point the, the music thing had more turned into i was just a sound engineer and i was doing lots of gigs with different bands and touring around the country and that was kind of more just what i was focusing on at the time and i really i didn't like it but it was just it was something i was good at and it was close to what i wanted to be but it had got to the point where I just I, I decided that if I keep doing this, if this is the road I'm on, this is what I'm going to be doing until I die. And is this what I want to do for the rest of my life? And it really wasn't. It was sound engineering was something that I kind of fell into because no one else would do it and found that I was OK at it or good at it. And then I just, you know, people started paying me for it. I was going, it's not I wanted to be the guy on the stage. I didn't want to be the guy making the people on the stage sound good. So it kind of got to a point where I just said, what is it that I wanted to do? You know, what do I want? Well, when I was young, what was I into? What was my my thing? And that was when I started drawing again and writing and getting back into, you know, comics and stuff like that. And again, the whole spiritual thing or the whole that's kind of spiritual is a crap term, whatever that thing is. The whole magic thing went kind of by the wayside. And at that point, I but just before that point, I had met um, Druids who had like a had their own kind of grove or whatever where they had performed these rituals and all that and i was hanging out with them for a while and again i was asking them, well, what what is it like what what do you do what 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 are you about like what do you believe what do you you know what is this magic they wouldn't have even used the word magic i don't think and again they couldn't tell me or wouldn't tell me one or the other and it was just kind of just seemed like they were larping to a large extent and they obviously didn't think that but i, I like either they didn't know or they just wouldn't tell me, or I just wasn't able to understand it at the time. So kind of disillusioned with all that. So I put all of the spiritual, whatever the word is, stuff away for a few years. Then concentrate on doing comics and writing and trying to trying to become a, a good artist and all that. So I spent a long time then hanging around with lots of arty comic people. And I became quite well known in the Irish comic scene here and set up big website that got um you know well known and all so it was kind of going well but it was like never i was never being myself in in all of that in that i wanted to i still had this kind of what's this all about what's the world all about why are we here all that and coming to disillusion from you know people i'd met the very few people i'd met who i thought might have an interest in it and then all the other people seemed to have the you know the anti-interest in it this atheist that's stupid if you believe any of this stuff you know, you're it's seen as being un, you're as not intelligent. It's a lack of intelligence to believe in anything other than science and atheism. And then, strangely enough, the thing that kind of got me back into it all was the secret and the law of attraction stuff, which is kind of in one sense a bit embarrassing, but it is what it is. Watching that, I kind of went, all oh, right, there's something to this, but I don't know what it is. It's obviously not about getting a new car. You know, there's a, there seems to be more, I don't know, more to it. And I couldn't, but I know, you know, it sparked an interest in, in, in me again about it. And then I came across, you know, the Grant Morrison disinformation lecture. Are you aware of that video? Yeah. 
And then that, that changed kind of everything because that's when I found Chaos Magic. And then that's when the game changed or whatever. And that's where I went, oh, that's where I started feeling that thing I was looking for. Oh, this is it. This is this is home in a sense. This is where I can I can branch out and kind of rest here and find where I'm going. And so then after that, I just devoured all magic stuff, all books, you know, all podcasts, websites, all that. You know, found Rune Soup, Gordon White's um, website from that. Peter J. Carroll's books, Alan Chapman and, and uh, Duncan Barford stuff, the Baptist Head stuff, um, Ramsey Dukes and Phil Hine, and which then eventually led up to me starting wanting to do my uh, write about it myself, my own experiences, which leads us up to Adventures in Woo Woo. That's a very rambly way of getting to <laughs> Adventures in Woo Woo, but uh, it's no, no, sure that's, ma- yeah. it's a fantastic explanation. I always like to hear people's personal journeys, so I'm not going to complain about that at all. But I, I do want to take a step back real quick. You're talking about chaos magic. Yeah. I know that you've defined what magic is on your blog. I know several other people that are in this field have done the same thing as well. But I, I want to throw some terms at you, and I just want you to tell me what the difference is between them. Is that okay? Sure, yeah, 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 yeah. If I can, and it'll be my opinion, not, <laughs> sure, <laughs> you know, yeah. my experience, yeah. Sure. But yeah. I'm wondering, you know, what the difference is between theurgy, magic, and chaos magic. Or is there any difference? Well, it's kind of magic and chaos magic is an approach to magic. So it's it's, it's kind of it's not different. Magic can it's, it's under the same umbrella. Theurgy is more like working with spirits and stuff like that. So it, it, you can that can be part of chaos magic, but it's not necessarily the best way I can um, describe. There's different ideas in what magic is. That's probably the best way to start. Magic um, for some people to have the energy model of magic which is what be like say like things like reiki or chi or frill or prana or any of these words that have popped up around the world to describe some sort of energy or life force etheric would have been the word that Stuart wilde used or um Blatvatsky or you know the or that sort of thing that there's some sort of energy and this energy can be directed to give you you know change to affect the world out there so that would be the energy model of magic. Then you have the spirit module of magic, which would be that you can commune with spirits, demons, devils, gods, angels, and they can intercede on your behalf. You can petition them or talk to them or make pacts with them, and they can have an influence on the world and your life and can arrange things so that your life becomes, you know, whatever whatever it is you desire. And there would be a form of that in animism, which would be... a uh, the kind of idea that everything has per- not everything but more than humans have personhood so you can have a river can have its own spirit a mountain can have its own spirit the earth has its own spirit you know like the Gaia the, uh, idea or planets have their own spirit the universe whatever not so like a rock can have um its own personhood but not every rock necessarily has like it just means that other things are people too and so that's an idea that these can be petitioned or can intercede in your behalf so that would be the spirit model of magic then you have the psychological model of magic which would say that it's all in your head and it's all kind of mind tricks to get you that you use all these uh, aesthetics or these ideas to get you into a place to believe these things and it's like to to how do you engage the placebo effect without in some way lying to someone so it's in, in a sense you use all these things to get yourself to believe so if you're rich, like say you're doing a ritual and you have dress up in the robes and, you know, you're calling on, you have the incense, you have the whole thing, the candles. The psychological model of magic would say that you're doing that for yourself rather than it's actually calling in any demon. It's putting you in the mood. It's like getting the atmosphere right so that you the change happens in your mind, if that makes sense. And the, like the, the kind of thing for that would be, again, I've seen like the placebo effect where that if you think something is doing good for you, it does. And the pl- placebo effect seems to be getting stronger in humans as it goes on, that it has a better effect and all that. So there has this kind of mind over matter idea that you can affect your reality around you because of you, you've changed in your mind. So like most of the time, what we see or how we view the world is through a lens that we've created. So like if you... If you're a jealous person, you see everything that your partner does as in through the lens of jealousy. So you think they are doing 
you know, but stuff that you don't want to do or, they're, you know, but getting chatted up or they're chatting other people up or they're doing whatever. But if you can change that lens, then it looks like their behavior has changed, but it hasn't really. It's just your view on the world has changed. So it, that would be kind of the psychological, what's well, what spirit, psychological, uh, energy model. Or uh, the other thing that, you know, that magic is, is something that we don't know what it is, you know, that it's the, um, another force of nature that's operating that, you know, we can tap into that science has yet to discover that kind of cliche thing. So it, it, it can be any of those things. And the idea with chaos magic then is that you can use any of those things you want. If it's useful, then you use it. So uh, if the psychological model of magic works for you, then use it. You know, it, there's no kind of, in my view of chaos magic, there's no kind of rules. It's about beliefs. It's about what you believe is what impacts most uh, on the thing. So if psychological model model works for you, then that's what you can go with today. And you can change your mind, go with something else tomorrow. Or if you go with the spirit model, try it out. So my kind of definition of magic is, or not definition, but my answer to the magic question, is magic real, is that that's the wrong question. It's, is it useful? And if it's useful, then you can use it. And if it's not, then you can drop it, which is kind of the, the case model chaos magic model idea of trying to strip down all the fancy and all the paraphernalia and all the baggage and try and get to the core idea of what all these things are and find what is the bit that works. So in a large extent, there's an awful lot of the psychological model in chaos magic, but there's woo in there too, if you want it. Does that in any way explain it? <laughs> that's a, no, I mean, yeah, that's a great explanation. I'm glad that you were able to lay that out. You know, I'm I'm still very new to the magical world that I live in, and, and learning about it, and discovering it, and and using it. I I haven't really got into much use for it yet. I, I haven't really been practicing anything yet. So yeah, the thing as well because I've listened to the other podcasts uh, that you've been doing as well, and like you're saying that you haven't really done much and stuff like that, and I think the best thing to do if you want to get into magic is just start doing it. it but it, it's the same for anything. If you want to learn how to draw, just start drawing. You know, If you want to learn how to write, just start writing. Just do it. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to get it right straight away or you're going to um, you know, be an expert or that you're not going to have to learn, but it, you're never going to learn as much until you, you do it. So start doing some sigils or start doing something and just see what happens. There's a great book that people want to get into magic and what it is, and it's Advanced Magic for Beginners by Alan Chapman. And general idea of it is try this, see what happens, take notes, do more of the stuff that works. And th I definitely think you want to get into magic. That would be probably a, a good place to start. And just do it, you know, just start doing it. Well, I appreciate that book recommendation. I'll, I'll definitely pick that up. When did you actually start practicing then? An awful lot of what I was kind of doing, a lot of the, like going back to say your man Stuart Wilde, a lot of what he talked about and what he would be into could be classed as chaos magic, but he wouldn't have classed it as chaos magic. So there would have been elements of stuff that I've been doing all along my life that would be seen as chaos magic, but I didn't know what, that it was chaos magic because I'd never heard of chaos magic. So things like, say that trance stuff or meditation, there's a thing he has where it's, a game you can play which is really interesting where you can get people to turn around and look at you and i got really really good at this look at so say you go to like a, a shopping mall or some public place and you see someone who's kind of facing away from you and the idea is you go up in your mind and you visualize standing behind them and breathing on their necks and then licking their neck it's like disgusting right obviously that but it's to some way in, in pulls or impinge on them and they'll turn around and look at you that sounds weird until you start doing it and people start turning around and looking at you. Not every time. If they're talking to someone or they're doing something, they're less likely to turn around. But um, they definitely uh, you will get an effect. So that's another one that you can start with. Rupert Sheldrick, or you ever his name? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he talks about that in the same type of thing of, you know, the sense of being stared at. So, you know, the people, there is this kind of, that you know when sometimes when you're being stared at, you know, or when someone is, you know, when there's some form of attention being put on you. So it's kind of a form of that. Sort of thing. So those things like that, that I kind of had done all along, again, not knowing that it was chaos magic, but actually deciding that, right, I'm going to do something magical probably was in around 2011 when I did the comic for sale, which starts with um, a conversation between me and a character that I had created from another book called Road Crew, telling him that this was a magical operation 
and that I was going to give him everything he wanted in the hope that it would mirror me getting everything I wanted in my real life. And that idea of a hyper sigil thing that Grant Morrison kind of more or less came up with, he definitely came up with the name in the comic the Invisibles where he would write characters, write scenes or whatever and use the medium of comics, his comic, his writing to try and affect change in the real, in his actual world. So I goes, I'm totally stealing that idea and I'm going to try it. So that would probably have been the first major kind of thing I'd done. I probably had done some sigils and I definitely had got great results using like kind of the positive thinking, law of attraction type stuff that definitely got some interesting things. So yeah, when exactly, I don't know that is the answer, like bits and pieces all over my life, but actually knowing I was doing say magic with knowing what the word was, chaos magic and doing actual thing was probably, yeah, about six, seven years ago. Well, you mentioned uh, just now the hyper sigil, you know, talking about Grant Morrison and then that you created your own. It's called Them. It's a graphic novel, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Let's stay on that. So for those of us that don't know, what, what exactly is a hyper sigil and how does it differ from a regular sigil? Or does it differ? Well, you see, here's the thing. Hyper sigil, a sigil, a servitor, or talisman, all these things kind of overlap and no kind of definite point where something ends and where something, you know, which one ends and which one begins. So kind of a sigil is a thing uh, where you make a representation of an idea or an intent or a desire and you put it into pictorial form for the most part. So, like, I mean, you can you can make sigils out of anything, but in the most classic, classic sense, um, pictorial form and then you launch it or activate it in some way and it goes and does whatever it's meant to do in the world. So an example of that would be to write down, I want or I have biscuits or I have chocolate milk, whatever it is, whatever your desire is. And then you write that down, cross out all the vowels, and then you cross out all the repeating letters. And then you, with the letters that you've left, you try to make something cool and magically shaped out of that. And then when that's done, when it looks like a sigil, when it looks magic, when you, know your, you know yourself and you look and it goes, that's it. You know, you have no, you have no doubt in your mind because just when you see it, you go, that's that's the way it's meant to be. And then you can you, like launch that into the world or whatever. And there's many, many ways of doing that. And some of the best ones I've come across is being anything with high emotion. You know, so like screaming, anger can uh, really get it. You know, get it wherever it's going. So it's like some people think it's getting into the subconscious. Some people think it's you know pushing it. And if you want to think of it like the Matrix, it's like a line of codes that you're now putting into the Matrix. Whatever. Like it's they're all bad i you know bad descriptions of what it is but we don't know what it is so we only have these bad bad examples or analogies so anyway like through emotion or through like there's the the masturbatory one or at the point of ejaculation you look at the sigil and that's like the most common one and the one that people laugh at most and that's the one grant morrison talks about in the that the sinful lecture music intense music you know that point when you listen to music and you know you get the shiver down the spine and that you know like you really into some emotional piece of music at that point of the highest ecstasy or the lowest low you look at the sigil and you know again you, you launch it into the thing again if this is the first time you've ever heard of it, it sounds mad all i can say is try it and you know see what happens so that's what a sigil is a hyper sigil then would be an ongoing kind of rather than a sigil as an individual thing i want hot chocolate you know, or I desire hot chocolate or I have hot chocolate, whatever way you have worded it. Whereas the hyper sigil is a kind of an ongoing piece of work that you you add to or manipulate in an ongoing sense, whereas sigil is kind of a one off thing. So a comic works really well. You know, if you're so every month you can add new stuff to it, you can change the characters, you can have representations of your characters doing different things that you want. Fiction of any kind is good, you know, like a book or whatever, where you can, you know, represent characters in the book to be representatives of characters in you know in your life a blog is good ones musicians you know can do you know songs or music or anything so a hyper sigil to kind of stop blabbing there is an ongoing work uh, an ongoing sigil that can be added to and manipulated in semi real time to affect change whereas a sigil is something that has one purpose one intent kind of one one use kind of a hit now, I have to quantify and clarify that by saying that a sigil can be, if you make a sigil for increased luck in gambling, for instance, that has an ongoing component where there's no end 
relationship. You know, there's no end goal in in a sense. Well, there's an end goal in that you want increased luck in gambling, but there's no end date or end moment. You know, it's not like I want the hot chocolate and then you get the hot chocolate and that's, you know, that's that done. So then you have kind of what is the what is the border of where a sigil is and where and where a talisman talisman begins? Because, you know, talisman would be something that you would have that you would have created or whatever to having an increased, say, luck in gambling in, in this example. So there is kind of a gray area at the end of sigils um, and talismans. And again, with servitors, which servitors are like a thought form that's given kind of its own autonomy or personality, often put into a physical object like a statue or a rock or a drawing or something that also has an ongoing kind of component to it, but isn't going to change in the way a hyper sigil will change as, as it moves along. Like So if you had created a servitor, which is all the same things as a sigil, other than you're giving it its own autonomy and energy to work separate from you, which is similar to a sigil, but it like, so say you make one for protection, a servitor to protect your house. And so that, and then you go and it'll be in the statue of, I know this dog statue you have. So that's kind of the servitor has an ongoing kind of role to play. Whereas a sigil kind of has a one-off thing to play and a hyper sigil has an ongoing role more, but the hyper sigil is more manipulated to change as you move along. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you also increased my desire for hot chocolate with that explanation. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, you see, you can you can sigil by talking. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I just recently read them for the first time. This is the graphic novel, the the hyper sigil that we're talking about, and definitely has magical quality to it. And it seems like a pretty. I mean, I guess it has to be because it's a hyper sigil that you're creating with intention. But it seemed like a pretty personal journey for you writing that. Could you share with the listeners what the story is about and how that story has actually mirrored your own life? Sure, yeah. At that, I kind of have to talk a bit about me again, which is, you know, the way that before I could talk about things. At that time, I, I was coming from in the middle of doing all this comic stuff and keep feeling quite trapped in, you know, in social media at the time. I had, I was on Facebook and I had friends from school. I had friends from comics. I had friends who I, you know... I just knew from real life. I had friends from music and all that, and none of them knew each other. And you know, then you had family, and they all kind of didn't gel together at all. And they're all kind of, you know, you kind of, I, I felt like I was in the middle of all this, these people. So I had this strong idea of a lot of voices in my head, and I wasn't, I didn't have a voice really because I was going like, I, I want to talk about magic or I want to talk about spirituality without feeling looked down upon or. Or without getting into an argument, like just where I can go, I believe this or I want to talk about it without someone from my life coming in. Like particularly there was a number of like this kind of not to pick an atheist because, um, you know, many of my friends are atheists and all that stuff. But it's very, very aggressive and very bullying and very intense energy that some of these people can have in the same way that religious people can have it's not it's a thing people have but it's particularly with the atheism in that it's or the massively you know the scientism the pro-scientist people love science not giving out about science but this pro-scientism people is that you have to think like this you know you are not allowed to think anything else other than science and i find that extremely restrictive and kind of I feel put down by it, you know, oppre- I find that majorly oppressive. So I found myself very oppressed, all mentally, like, I mean, not in, in reality, like the people around me were all really nice or whatever. So, so it's, all, it's all head stuff, like this is all in my head. Where I felt like I was going to explode in some way because it had all got too intense where I was not being who I felt I wasn't being let be who I wanted to be or who I was, not who I wanted to be because, you know, I am who I am. And it's all in the head. Like there was no one. The secret of uh, in the end is that no one cares. Like no one. Cares. So this is all you are doing. I am doing to myself. So this is the point I was at. <laughs> and I goes well, well. What way could I get out of this? So I says to do it through. You know, do this hyper sigil. Do it where you put a character who's in the same situation as you, only slightly different, where you can expose him to and push him into the boundaries of things and see what happens him. And by what happens to him ha- should have an effect on me too. Because I find when I'm writing, the best way to write or to, 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 you can give an idea for a story 
and for characters. And you know it's working when the characters start doing something different than what you had in mind. And they become, have this life of their own. So in a sense, the main character in them, uh, Roman, I wanted him to start. I was going to put him in a situation. And I knew what the end and what I wanted. But I was going to throw all the shit at him that I felt I was getting in my head and see how he sorted it. And in the hope that he would sort it out, and then therefore it would sort out for me. With the risk of what if he doesn't sort it out and it becomes all worse and, you know, I become further in my own head and further depressed and all that kind of thing. So the then starts, because I wanted it to be a successful working, it starts, the opening of it is Roman is a success. He's a painter or he's an artist. So we have this kind of immediate reflection from my life who op- the opening of the book comes with him coming out on stage and being praised for some great artwork that he has done. And he is a success. So that was my fail safe in that if I started with a success, it kind of, you know, pre-guaranteed or presupposed an actual success. Then it goes into how he got there, you know, so it goes back in time, that old, that old trope where he is struggling with not being accepted or not being in the place in life where he wanted to be or where he thinks he deserves in that kind of this whole thing of that, you know, that whole you, uh, if you book them, they will come thing. And I think that I, I think it's so destructive for people, particularly for creative people, because it kind of assumes or makes people believe that if you do the thing, then everything works out. So if you show up with your piece of art, then, you know, if you book them, they will come, then everything, you know, everything else should fall into place. And most of the time it doesn't. You know, you, you do your podcast and, you know, you do 20 episodes and still no one cares. Or you write your book and, you know, you spend uh, years doing it and you publish it and no one cares. And you go, but I did the thing, you know, I booked them. Why, why haven't they come? And it can be very, it can be very shocking to realize that just by showing up isn't, you know, a guarantee of anything. Just by, you know, this thing we have that if you put enough hard work and effort into something that you're guaranteed success. And then when you put the hard work and effort and you do everything right. And then you don't get the success. It can be, you know, it can be world shattering kind of, you know, this isn't what I thought the world was about. And that was kind of the, the predicament I was putting Roman into in that he hadn't got he he felt he had showed up, that he had done everything right. He had played all the rules, but I've done everything right. You know, I've done all the rules. I have followed all the things I've done what you're meant to do. I've done the art, I've persevered, I've done the thing and nothing. No one gives a shit. And he he can't deal with it. And it starts flooding out into his other, other life where he starts getting jealous of people who are getting success and, um, you know, envious and, you know, become he's like in the, in the beginning of the book, he's a, he's quite the asshole, like, you know, and people, you know, would tell me after I, I, I'd let them read the first, first chapter or so. And they were going like, I really don't like him. And I go, that's okay. You know, you don't have to like him. It's, he's not, it's not a likable kind of view, but it's an honest view because it, like in many ways, that's how I felt that I felt I'd, I had a, personally I'd showed up. I had done the work. I, you know, I hear me standing with my shiny thing and I'm going, well, well, you know, why hasn't the universe got my back? You know, that, that people's that other statement of, you know, if you follow through in your dreams or pursue your dreams, follow your bliss, the universe will conspire to make things work. And then you're, you're standing there going, where the fuck's the universe? You know, <laughs> well, where's, where's their bit? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and, uh, so, Roman's way of dealing with it is he just can't deal with it anymore. And he, there's a, an accident and he ends up in hospital and he loses his hand. So he loses the ability to be able to paint. So his dreams are out and everything is over. And at that point, it all starts getting very weird because it all becomes very mental. So these voices that I had I felt that were in my head, like the voices of an art teacher I had when I was at school who really put me off art. And, you know, he kind of, rather than increase my love for drawing whatever really killed it he was not very supportive and you know just because i wanted to do comics and that kind of style he was very down on that and so i had this that was one of the voices in my head so he that that that's became one of the voices in roman's head and i you know stuff that like uh how things my father had said to me or things my mother had said to me, or, you know, these kind of things that stick in your head that people have said to you over the years where it, there's just so many of them that when you think of something, you, you hear other people's voices in your head telling you you're wrong or stopping you or, you know, 
telling you're a shitty person or whatever it is. So all these kind of voices. So Roman has starts seeing these physically. This, the, the people, the, rather than just being disembodied voices in his head, they start coming to him in the physical sense. Like when he's leaving the hospital, they start the, the voices that repeat are actual physical and they start chasing him. And they become more added as he goes along, as he goes through, you know, the, the further on his journey, whatever, to the point of the dem, which is the dem of the title, is like this zombie horde of voices following him along the, the whole way. It get, well, the way. I'll put it this way. It gets really, really, really bad for Roman. And it got really, 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 really bad for me too, which, you know, I really should have seen coming. But uh, <laughs> I did. it's like uh, Grant Morrison talks about when he did The Invisibles that he uh, there's a point in it where um, the main character, um, his lungs collapse and he's been beaten up or whatever. And then Grant Morrison himself ends up in hospital with his lungs collapsed and all that. And he goes, I really should have known better. And I'm going to be... <laughs> I'm going to be, you know, much better to the uh, to this character. And so then, like, the next six issues is that character just having wild sex for, like, six issues. So, so again, so wait, I should Is that all it takes is for me to just write a comic and, and then I can script myself having wild sex? Yeah, <laughs> in a way, but it, it might necessarily be a comic. It'll be, you know, it's... Sure. It, yeah, you know, it'll be something. But, like, he definitely, uh, Grant Morrison talks about that his sigils, he says, always work. My sigils don't always work, but uh, Grant Morrison's sigils always work. And like he was, was seeing immediate reactions from his Invisibles work. You know, he would meet people that he would do, uh, make a scene in Invisibles for him to meet certain type of women or certain things. And it would happen straight away. And he just had to get more refined at it because he would get the person he wanted, but it would come with all the stuff that he didn't want. So, you, you know, that that's kind of the, um, the old trick with magic is you'll get what you want, but be careful what you wish for because you'll, you know, you'll get it. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. So, so with them, with Roman, he was, uh, so it gets very bad from it. And then it, it obviously, seen, best way to do it, the scenes in it that happen that directly then happened to me. To a point, it, there's a, when I was doing up the write-up for Adventures in Movie for the website, it, the original thing that was, I did it and I said, this didn't work. This hyper sigil failed in the end. And I came back to it year maybe a bit more later and what happened was that i didn't realize was that i it wasn't finished i was assuming that because the comic had been finished a couple of years ago that the repercussions or the magical element of it would have you know happened by now but it, i was still in the middle of it i was actually a guy a friend of mine Ian, said it to me at the time because you're still in the middle of that and you don't realize it. and i went yeah, yeah 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 but i definitely have only recently has the full fruits of them Cord. And even now, I would still say it's not fully done with me. There's still bits that echo through. I choose to believe that anyway. So, but it's it's it was frighteningly, literally frighteningly, how accurate some of it became. Now, did I bring that on myself? In the, let's let's go with the psychological model of magic. Did I bring that on myself and all these things? Well, if I did, it still was my intent to get through the problems and issues that I had, and it happened. And it happened as much in my head as it did through circumstance. So it seems to me a, a, an element of woo to it that uh, more than it's just all in my head. But the, again, it goes back to like, there's really no way not to or to disprove solipsism. I really cannot. Everything I've experienced from the moment I was born or the moment I can remember experiencing anything has been in my head. There's nothing I can experience outside of my head. So when they say, oh, it's all in your head, yeah, but everything is in my head. Every single thing I've ever experienced this. So it's that thing Lon Milo the Cat says, it's all in your head. You just have no idea how big your head is. <laughs> That's for sure, man. And I, I want to tell you, too, that the story in them really spoke to me. I, I actually saw a bit of myself in the Roman character. And honestly, <laughs> it really uh, put some of the current events in my life into perspective for me. So I have to thank you for that. I'm a firm believer that everything comes into your life right when it's supposed to. So whether that's a person or a graphic novel from an Irish chaos magician. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's, <laughs> yeah, I, absolutely. I read that story right when I was supposed to read it, and it spoke to me, so thanks for that. Brilliant. I'm delighted. That's, you know, I mean, that's awesome. That's really good. I think the, the secret of that is, I think, which is what kind of bring it around to say my blog, The Adventures in Woo I try to be as honest as possible. And I think in them, I can't, I couldn't have been any more honest about things other than make a totally actual autobiographical and, you know, 
have a picture of me and it's Tommy and rather, you know, it's still as fiction. So it's not, but it's as honest as fiction as it possibly can be. And I think that if you're honest, then it can only reflect in other people's lives too, because I don't think I'm special. I don't think I'm unique. You know, I don't think my experiences are radically different from other people's experiences. So if I can be honest and open about stuff that I'm going through, I have to assume that other people are going to see some similarity in it. So if I can get past some of these things, then hopefully the things that I have discovered along the way can be helpful to other people as well, rather than just the whole idea of it's in theory, these things work, you know, you know, I've heard that if you, you know, you go to counseling, whatever it works, whatever, I don't know, this kind of thing, if, the, if this worked for me, I don't think I'm that special. I don't think I'm that unique. So it probably will work for other people too, which is the whole idea of adventures and movie. So rather than coming across trying to be like a teacher, I'm not a teacher and I, I, you know, I don't know enough to be, I'm not an expert, I'm not qualified and I certainly don't know enough about any topic to be teaching anyone anything. But I did teach, as I said, I did teach music and guitar for a long while and I realized that you don't really know a subject until you explain it to someone else. And that's because you have to formulate it in a sense in your head to be able to explain it to someone else. So the blog, I want to be about my experiences, my honesty, hopefully reflecting other people and they could get it. And also a great way of trying to sort all these things out in my own head by having to formulate it in such a way that it makes sense to other people, if that makes sense. Absolutely, man. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of your blog, I wanted to talk about a couple things that I found on there that I really like. And I hate to keep you talking about yourself and your own personal journey here, but you've written about how magic wasn't working for you at some point. And I wanted to know why yeah. why that was. Yeah, it, it like didn't work for a long time. Like the kind of the joke of Adventures in Woo Woo, the title is that I wasn't sure at all if magic was a thing or not. Because you'd go on to forums and you'd go on to, you know, or you'd read books and all these people having these amazing experiences. You know, I've meditated for years and I've never had these experiences that people talk about in meditation or, and then magic, you know, all these amazing things. I was going, is that true? <laughs> you know, like, it, so it sort of felt like I'm, I felt like I was outside the building. There was a big magic party going on inside and I was kind of looking through the window going, can I come in? <laughs> Please let me into the magic party. Because my magic wouldn't work. You know, it was like I would do stuff and for a long while I, it even came that I would get the exact opposite of what, like it would be spooky in that I knew something was happening, but it would be the exact opposite of what I wanted. Like, so it's, and it's a common occurrence that sometimes when you say you sigil or you enchant for money and then a huge bill comes in that and makes you have even less money. And it's like, right something's happening but it's the opposite of, of what i want but most of it was that it just i was having no effect i was doing stuff and there was a big kind of uh, interest in ancestor work at the time and people kind of trying to create some sort of not bonds some sort of um interaction with ancestors not necessarily your direct ancestors in uh, you know your grandparents or people have died but the mighty dead or any of these things and i tried it for i was doing it for months and months of just like offerings and i was burning hell money and i was trying to you know anything just something happened something to you know get me over this line of magic is real and then i you know i can start i can actually start you know once I know that magic's real, now I can start, right? Now I can sit and actually do the magic. And of course, that's not how it works. So I had that thing. So I knew there was something happening because I was sometimes getting the opposite. The also the thing would say, I knew that even things is sort of trite as the law of attraction and the secret and a lot of that new age stuff. The problem with like the law of attraction and secret is not that it doesn't work. It's that sometimes it really, really does work. And it's so you're, where you're left with the thing of going like, why did that work and not this other stuff? So I was getting into the thing. I was going, well, what, what, what is it? What is that thing? What is the thing? And it turns out, of course, that that thing is me. <laughs> the thing that's stopping it, the thing that's blocking it is not the process. It's not the magic. It's not the books. It's not the people. It's me. I'm doing it. So, I mean, like, you can have, take the, the law of attraction thing, right? Just, I know I'm going to, this is the most I've gone on about the law of attraction in years. I just don't know why it's coming out today, but there it is. If you take something like the law of attraction, why does that not work a lot of the time? It doesn't work a lot of the time because of you. You know, it's like if you were looking for love, say, as an example, and you feel unlovable, no matter how much you think about getting a new love partner, it's not going to happen because you you are the problem. Getting people into it, like you wouldn't even, if you have people 
coming to you, you won't even recognize. It's that thing if you know when you like you look in the open the cupboard or whatever, and there's um or and there's things, and you look for the salt, and you look for the salt, and you can't see the salt. Where is the where's the salt? And then someone behind you points at it, and it's right in front of you. Like that whole thing where sometimes we just can't see what's right in front of us. And a really nice kind of definition of magic that I like is that magic is the finger that points at the thing that's right in front of you. That has always been there. But until you can get to the point where you can see it, you know, you're not going to see it. So what I found was that going back then to say them and all that and feeling about that, uh, you know, I've shown up, I've shown here what my shiny thing, I've done, where's, why isn't the universe getting me back? And going, wow, look at how much of a victim I think I am. And all this victim mentality and this feeling that, you know, I self kind of righteous, I deserve this, you know, I, I by, um, you know, this privileged kind of mind. And I was, I remember, I was just kept asking myself over and over again, what is this? What is, what is the thing I'm missing here? You know, cause my, when I was saying, just cause my magic was working on was, what is it I'm missing? And I spent like two days just a- asking myself over and over, like really doing my head, <laughs> my head and thinking of it. And I was in bed that night and I could feel this thing coming like a train. This was something, it was coming at me like, a, like an energy type thing, like some sort of force, but it was, it was, I thought I was going, I'm getting close to what, what it is, what it is, what it is. And it just eventually just hit me. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm a total arsehole. And I could see all of these shitty things I'd done, how I act in situations, how I, like one of the things that became very obvious is that rather than me standing up for myself and say someone asked me to do something, I don't want to do it. I would see, I suddenly realized that the thing I do is that I will do it begrudgingly and kind of in a way that it will show people, look what you've done to me by asking me to do this. Rather than just saying, I don't want to do it. You know, it's just kind of trying to hurt people. And it's like just being this victim. So this energy or whatever it was this thought hit me like a ton of bricks of, that I was just being a massive victim, playing a victim purposely for because it's easy to be a victim. It's easy for me to be a victim only talking about myself because it means that you don't actually have to take responsibility because you can blame everything on everything you consume. My life, I showed up. I did my bit, you know. Did you do your bit? You, you, you drew and wrote a comic. So have millions of people. You know, just because you've done that doesn't mean that you deserve anything. But it was kind of, I was doing it so that I could say, look, no one loves me. I've done my thing and no one loves me. And it was terrifying and it was horrible. And it all hit me all in an instant. But at the same time, it felt like like this massive weight just dropped off me. As horrible as it was, it was just like this relief. And then, you know, you have to spend a few days realizing, oh, my God, I'm a, like going through different situations in your head, different life things, just how much of just how much uh, an arsehole I was that I didn't realize I was. And once I started working and all that kind of stuff and when I got onto you know, other stuff like that was just one revelation or other things, whatever. Once I started getting through some of that shit, then my magic started working very like instantly. So it was that thing of I couldn't see the salt because of my own bullshit. And as soon as I could, you know, wade my way through a bit of the bullshit, there was the finger of magic pointing at the salt. So why did my magic not work? It was because I was an arsehole. <laughs> <laughs> that's a pretty, that's a pretty fair explanation. Yeah. And yeah. I, I think this relates well to a line that I pulled out from one of your blogs that I really liked. You wrote that invoking Dionysus to be confident at, at parties is a great idea as long as you are also working on the goal to become the person who doesn't need invocations of party gods to feel confident. I think that's what you're that's talking it. about. Yeah, absolutely. Like the whole, since all, all this kind of revelation thing is the whole thing of the, uh, that there is a huge need for personal development and self-help stuff in occult and magic circles to like, there is a thing, uh, um, you know, like the, the left hand path, right hand path thing where some people don't think that exists or that it's a, a throwback to Blatfatsky theosophy and it's a whole different discussion. But what I have found is that an awful lot of people kind of move from a right hand path to a left hand path and all they've done is really change the names, but they haven't changed anything. So with people who come from like, say, a very Christian background who suddenly swing over to like a left hand path thing will kind of change. And it's, it's weird in that Jesus becomes the same character, only now he's called Lucifer. He's the real light bringer. He's the kind of thing and it, it you know it's kind of it, you've just changed the names now jehovah is now satan and jehovah is the real devil and it's kind of going but it's exactly the same you've had ex- it's exactly the same tv show that you've been watching you've just changed all the names and it's this kind of you, where you've come from i don't need to pray to god 
for, um, you know, this help. But I will invoke Azazel and, you know, this is much more powerful and thing. And it's, it's, you still know sovereignty there. You're still asking someone else to do it. So the point is, what it is that there's not enough emphasis on the magician themselves to become powerful, great and better rather than so much magic, particularly in the spirit module of magic is this intercession or, you know, asking other beings, higher beings to do stuff for you rather than learning how to do it for yourself. So even with things like just, I suppose, at some stage, bring in the 40 servants, which are 40 kind of archetypes or energies. The ultimate aim is that Dionysus line quote is that you invoke or you ask for the help of these energies until the point of you learn to become them yourself, which it should be the ultimate point. It shouldn't be that you get better at asking beings to do stuff for you. You should be able to, I personally think, the idea, the end goal is for you to be able to do it yourself, which probably lends itself more to the psychological model than to the spirit model, because if it's the spirit model, then but humans are spirits, too. Like, we, we, where's our, you know, you have that whole holy guardian angel or your future magic self. So, yeah, I don't know. Does that make sense? Am I rambling there towards the end? So You're absolutely fine, man. And it's a great segue into the 40 servants, obviously. Pretty big project that you've just recently rolled out. It's a pretty cool concept. Could you tell people, and I know you've done this on your blog and your podcast as well, which we haven't even mentioned yet, but could you tell people what the 40 servants is and how this idea came about? Sure. Yeah. The 40 servants is ostensibly uh, an Oracle deck. So it's 40 cards that you can use as you would any tarot or Oracle deck for divination. So you can get a read and get some sort of uh, information on Kind of your fortune telling or whatever, whatever that, you know, divination is exactly. We're not sure. It seems to be work better in short term rather than long term. So there is some sort of element of woo to it. Or we can look at it as a psychological module as well, that it's giving you a different um, an outside opinion on stuff in your head, whatever. So it ha- it's an, a normal kind of divination, oracle, tarot card type thing. But it has this double meaning or this double use where each of the cards are also servitors and we we're talking about servitors earlier in that they are thought forms or ideas that have a certain amount of autonomy or you know, self or personhood that can be used to affect change in your life and the, if, if you're not buying the word it can work in that sort of Jungian archetype thing of you know these are energies or powers of archetypes that we can invoke to that thing that's like say the Dionysus thing where you can invoke Dionysus where if that's even if that's just in your head you still become better at parties so it's that that kind of idea so there's 40 archetypes so you have things like the fortunate so say if you work with the fortunate in a magic sense you can invoke or you can ask or you, you know you can I was gonna say petition but I don't like the word petition because it kind of sounds like you know you're pleading and and it's not they're they're servants they're there for you to use them they're not there for you to ask the reason I kind of have to say that is because there's a lot of confusion in the Facebook group about that. People kind of want to put them on, a, on this kind of God level or deity, and they're not. They're servants. They're energies that have been created, or they're types of archetypes that have been created for you to use them. So you don't, petition is the wrong word, but you can ask, <laughs> or you can tell them. So you talk to the fortunate and to bring more fortune and good luck to you. So if you were from a spirit kind of uh, model of magic, that would be literally the servitor and the spirit and energy of, say, the goddess Fortuna is coming in and affecting your life. From a psychological model, it would be that you feeling lucky, you're more likely to, make, to take chances on luck, you know, more opportunities. When you focus on something, you see things, you know, it's like when, when you um, hear a word for the first time and then, you know, oh, that's interesting. And then you hear it three more times that day. It's not that the word has suddenly become um, more used. It's just that you now know the word and so you can see it. So if you are more focused on fortune and good luck, you now see it. So, so that'll be from the, the psychological kind of point of view. I try to always bring it around to explain it to all um, in different ways what the magic is because not everyone, you know, not everyone buys the spirit model, not everyone buys the psychological model, you know, or whatever it is. So it works on many levels is kind of what I'm saying about the 40 servants. So anyway, the 40 archetypes that can be used for both divination and magic. 
and there's plenty of stuff in it uh, of different archetypes, different energies, different servants that can be used for any kind of thing that may arise for you. In a, so in a sense, it's a complete magic system, both divination and actual change and effect in the world around you. I don't want to go through all 40 of them, but I would like to know what some of your personal favorites to work with are or... Maybe also the servants who have gotten the best or worst response from other people who have worked with them. Sure. Yeah. The, I'll go with the, the response. One. The, the big one that people talk about most is the fixer. And this is the guy who everything can be, anything can be done at a price. Any problem can be solved if you're willing to do whatever it is that needs to be done. And so the idea of that if you work with the, the fixer, that there will be a price to pay for it. People freak out, out about this. So it's, it's kind of the servant of last resort when everything else has failed and you've no other, no other ideas or opportunities, or whatever. This is the, the guy. But it's because of that. But as soon as you warn people about something, that's the first one everyone wants to use. But they kind of don't, you know, they feel like, well, what is the price to pay? And sometimes the price can be bad. Like if you, if you want your dad's house, you know, like when my dad dies, I want his house as well. You know, and I want to be or, you know, you say, I want to be in that house. So, I mean, there's a chance your dad may die, you know, like, I mean, that's very severe. And it's the, obviously the one that's taught it a lot that, you know, if you do money magic, that you have to be very specific that it doesn't come as an inheritance. And I've heard that story a lot. I've never actually heard, heard it in happening in reality, but it's the it's the warning. It's the warning story. But the other thing with the fixer, the price you pay doesn't always necessarily have to be something terrible. It can be like, if you want to be, if you want to, like, say you, if you want to do a podcast, the price to pay to do a podcast is learning how to use the podcast software, learning how to host your pos- your, your podcast, spending the time editing, you know, emailing people, doing the actual podcast, getting the word, doing all the crap social media that you have to do. So all of these, that's the price that has to be paid. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a bad negative thing but it can be and some people have had crazy experiences with the fixer where they have you know had stuff happen and then they go but i i I didn't want that you know if you ask for the promotion in your job and someone already has that job to get that job that person has to be fired so i mean there's there's a price to be paid in that kind of way so that's the one that kind of people latched on to in there's three Facebook groups. There's a like an English speaking one, a Spanish one, and a Brazilian one. And I don't speak Spanish or Brazilian, but the, you know I get the really bad Google Translate. But it's interesting. In the Brazilian one, they are crazy for using the fixer. They have no worries about it whatsoever. Big into it, whatever. In the English speaking one, they're all terrified. Won't use them. So there's cultural differences for you, Brazilians. I was say, like, no what, fear. What do you attribute the vigor and zest in the Brazilian community for this figure that scares the the English speaking community? English speaking in majority probably have more to lose than Brazilians who are like probably are closer in many ways. Going by some of the stories I read are uh, in a worse position, so they might necessarily, you know, like if if your life's pretty okay, you don't want it to fuck up too much. But if your life's pretty shit, you might be okay with it, doing whatever has to be done. That could be it. Or else Brazilians are just mad and they're happy to, you know, have a crazy life. <laughs> Yeah. You also have a grimoire coming out that yes. will support this, right? Yeah, well, the PDF, the guidebook that's there, it's it's about 80 pages, whatever. And I kind of, the thing about the 47 is I expected 10 people to be interested in it at most. You know, it was like, it came from when I was doing the comics, whatever, where I'd spend all this time doing the comics, put them out, and 10 people would buy it. Not quite, but, you know, like, a handful of people buy it, a number of people, and then a week later, no one you know can remember it. So I was expecting something similar with the Ford Servants, where it would be something cool that I would use. That I why I did it mostly for me to use. There was something that I wanted to have in my arsenal, and I'd put it out there. Maybe a handful of people would like it, and I better do a PDF to explain it. And I rushed the PDF. It's full of mistakes. It's, you know, it's I wrote I wrote it in a week and a half, something like that. You know, like in forty hours or something like that. And um, just assuming that, you know, that'll do to the, the 10, 20 people who will be into it. And then, you know, it turned out that loads of people <laughs> were into it, you know, and I was like, oh, I really should have spent a bit more time on the actual PDF. So I said, I will rather than again rushing it, I will spend some time and actually do a proper print book for people, you know. And so that's what I've been working on. And it's the Grimoire of Fort Seven. So it'll have 
all of the stuff that's in the PDF, all of the things that we've learned about the servants since and how to use them, loads of rituals, loads of divination ideas, loads of, there'll be a mantra for each servant, a prayer for each servant and keywords, loads of stuff that isn't in the PDF. There will be far less uh, typos and uh, repeated words and silly mistakes, hopefully. So I'm actually getting this one um, proofread and it will also have a full color, full page images of each of the servants. So if you don't want, if, if divination is not your bag and you're not into it, you can use this book on its own without having to buy the deck. You know, just the whole magic thing will be there. So you would only need the deck if you actually wanted to have the divination thing. So that's what I've been working on at the minute. And I'm close, but it's, it's not quite there. So I've actually taken off last week, next week, and possibly the week after of doing my blog, the podcast and the videos and all that, just to devote all my time, just to get this done so that I can be given to a couple of uh, people just to get some feedback, then to the proofreaders and then onto Amazon and then the world. And then, you know, then take over the world in some form or whatever. <laughs> Although, uh, to, to, yeah. be, to, be, to be honest, I, I re- does anyone, would anyone want the responsibility of taking over the world it seems like an awful lot of work <laughs> yeah I'd rather, well, i mean yeah. I, I think there are a, a group of people out there that would love to do that so that, yeah very or true that, and all, or that are those seem it. to hold office yeah. <laughs> but it's a thing um you've talked about before and that there's a thousand true fans and i mean it's so that's that's just so true you know that like if you have you don't need four million people 20 million people to be into this you need handful of people who are really into it and can support you and whatever which is why things like kickstarter work and patreon work and mm-hmm. all this kind of stuff you know so it's or you know like one super fan you know like what well, you see things where people you know get really into certain games or whatever and spend 40 grand on games like just, these people are out there <laughs> you know you just have to find them and get them interested in your thing <laughs> so yeah i i need a podcast like sugar mama or sugar daddy that's it, you know. Yeah. I just, just, just one, you know. That, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Hey, before we go, you know, we we mentioned your podcast a couple of times. I just wanted to shout that out. You know, you started your own podcast recently, very appropriately named the Tommy Kelly Podcast. It's on iTunes, yeah. SoundCloud, your website. Yeah, um, it's a very original title. If I say so myself. <laughs> well, I like your approach to it because it's just you talking into a microphone, sharing personal stories about your magical practices, and offering up some tips on how to improve, you know, magical practices for the. Yeah, it's just a case of why I wanted to do the podcast, and it wasn't. Again, coming from that, I don't care if anyone listens to it. I I don't mind if you know. It no one ever hears about it or cares about it. It's just a, it's something in a discipline self discipline plenary type thing to do it to put myself forward and to banish that thing of being afraid to talk about these things you know that i i would love to do a podcast but i'm what if someone hears it? you know what i mean and then talk so it's like part of it was to become better at that to be become open about it not that i'm particularly hidden but i don't like i've said I, no one in my real life is into any of this stuff. So the only way I get to talk about this thing is by talking to myself into a microphone every Monday. <laughs> and, you know, but it's, it's that. It's it's same for the website, same for the comics, and same for Fort I do all this stuff for me in a, like an extreme selfish way with the hope, but if, as I are saying, that I don't think I'm that unique or that my story's that unique. That So if I can find solutions or something, insight or an interest or something that it may help other people, but, selfishly my main goal is to become a better person myself and to become better at it that way so doing the videos doing youtube videos because i had a big issue with how i look because i was quite overweight until uh, recently uh, so do that so that that's another level you break that down now people know what you look like you no know, so to just get on it you know it's, it's not something that's there in your mind anymore you've banished it you've banished that thing because it's out there it's you've broken that thing so can we end this on another personal story? Because I, I really liked the very first episode you did of your podcast where you were talking about black mirror scrying and shamanic eye gazing. Scrying is not something that I see a lot of people talking about in more modern times. No, I'm no. only familiar with it from like, you know, reading about John D and Ed Kelly and those kind of guys back in the Renaissance era. But you did some scrying, right? Yeah, yeah, I made uh, a black mirror from um, an IKEA frame, which I think the IKEA frame was like three 
euro or something, something really cheap. And I just sprayed the inside of it black so that when you turn it around and put it back in, you know, has or it reflects out whatever. Does that make sense? That, am I explaining that okay? So you yeah. take the frame apart, you spray the, the glass or the plastic bit on the back with black paint so that when you turn it around, it's shiny black in the front and then you put it back together so it looks like a black mirror. So the idea of scrying is then you look into that in some sort of low light and see what happens. And for some people, loads of things happen. Like for, I said, John D, he, the end result is that he, uh, um, you know, the whole Enochian alphabet and all the uh, Enochian magic came from it. Well, actually, he didn't see it. It was um, Edward Kelly who said that he, uh, John D couldn't scry for the life of him, supposedly, uh, which is why he needed the help. And I, I'm not massively great at at it either but it's very interesting if you can get the concentration up and if you've done any sort of meditation stuff it will be a lot easier for you but you you kind of zone out and things change and i could definitely see it why people would be interested in doing it in a sort of even in a divinatory kind of sense you know like the cool like actually crystal ball and looking into things and all that would it would be something you'd try do you think you'd have you'd be interested in or oh fuck yeah man fuck yeah yeah (laughs) for sure yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's like years ago, I did it. I When I was like 18, 19, I took a load of mushrooms and I was always warned, whatever you do, don't look in the mirror. And uh, when, you know, when you're on these things, or whatever. And I decided, well, that's obviously the very first thing I'm going to do. Um, and I just spent hours looking at myself. So it's kind of that kind, you know, that kind of thing where things just change around when you relax your vision on it and uh, now it's obviously nowhere near what it's like when you're on psilocybin or anything like that but there's an element of it there's a kind of something that is similar and especially if you can do it with someone else if you can stare into someone else's face and you're best to look at between their eyes just because it it's easy to relax your eyes on between their eyes and their faces definitely in my experience change and become weird and you can see like animal faces or other faces and some people say it's past lives and all that i don't know i just think it's cool anyway whatever what, whatever it is well that's cool man <laughs> i'm fascinated by scrying i don't know why i, I just it, it's a kind of a lost practice to me i don't know anybody that talks about it or even does it so well the other one as well is you can put black ink in your hand or in a bowl and you can look into it that's one people do it kind of died off i think if you read any of the grimoires and stuff and talking about scry- scrying is that um there's this whole element where you need a young, innocent boy with you, which kind of isn't, it's not really cool anymore. You know, it's really, that sort of stuff is frowned on <laughs> yeah. where, you know, so like the, the actual magician wouldn't usually be the person who was doing the, the scrying themselves. So see, you were doing sort of like a spirit conjuration, whatever. So you're in your circle and you're raising whoever from the Goetia or whatever. You would have this young, innocent boy looking into the, the bowl of black water or into the crystal ball or whatever and he would be the person who would be seeing it's the stuff and the magician would be asking him what is he seeing you know what is he saying anything and the boy would relate it back so there's probably an element if you if you want to think of it classically that the older you get probably the less likely you are to be good at it because it needs this young innocent imagination you know your imagination is amazing when you're a kid and then it sucks as you grow older you know unless you really look after it so there's probably an element of that so that people don't do it now because it's hard to do as an adult, you know, and you can't, it's, you can't, you just can't have a young, innocent boy doing magic with them in this day and age. It's just not cool, you know, so. No, no, it's not for some reason. Yeah, yeah so. No, although it depends on who you ask, you know, the elite seem to, it might be something that they're, they're, they're really into, but that's a, that's a whole other conversation. That's a whole other podcast for <laughs> yeah. sure, definitely. So, Tommy Kelly, thanks for being here, man. Tell people where they can keep up with you and your work then. The best place to find me is adventuresandwoowoo.com and the podcast and the newsletter and the videos and everything. You can get it all from there. There's 40 Servants Facebook page, which if you just search 40 Servants, you'll find it. But if you go to the40servants.com, there's links for everything to buy the deck, to get the digital deck, to get the free PDF, to you know, the blog posts and all that. And all the card meanings themselves are on that page as well. So, I mean, you can totally delve into the Ford Servants without spending a penny if you really want to. So it's it's all there. Well, that's pretty cool, think- yeah, man, to, to give that out to people. But I would suggest uh, there is a, a shop link on your site that you can buy that stuff too. So 
And if you are going to buy it, try and buy six or seven of them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tommy's got to eat, man. <laughs> yeah, it's, just, yeah it's, it's better luck to buy uh, six of them than it is to buy one. <laughs> right, right. So, hey, man, thanks for the time. Really appreciated the chat. Enjoyed it. Good luck to you and your adventures in Woo Woo. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you, Ryan. And I just have to say, I love your podcast. I think it's great. And fair to you. Keep it up because it's wonderful. Abracadabra. Holy shit. My thanks again to Tommy Kelly. What a real and raw and honest dude. Although I recently learned dude is strictly American slang, so I guess I should say what a real, raw, honest fella. Love him and love that conversation. Please do check out his blog, Adventures in Woo Woo, where you can find much more of his work, including the 40 Servants, them, and his podcast. All of that is linked in the show notes. As I mentioned in the introduction, this conversation resonated with me and convinced me to take magic a bit more seriously in my own life. I've talked before about how I don't practice magic much, I've done a few things here and there, and I have to say the results were slow to start, but I am beginning to see more of them, which is both encouraging and exciting and does make me obviously want to do more with it. I haven't tried working with spirits yet, I've mostly just been working on this psychological and energy model and trying to build up my own magical strength and stamina. I'm not too comfortable with the idea of invoking spirits yet, I guess. And I also want to give scrying and shamanic eye gazing a shot, so maybe a trip to Ikea is in the cards for me in the near future. And hey, if you're interested in helping me get to Ikea, check out oculturepodcast.com slash support. You can support the show with a one-time donation or on a monthly basis. There are seven different levels of support from the initiate level at $1.11 a month all the way up to the ascended master level at $13.13 a month. In fact, our first subscription came through just recently and the title of Magician has been bestowed upon Adam Roan. Hope you said your last name right there, Adam. Adam supporting the show at $5.55 a month. Fellow resident of the Kingdom of Ohio as well. Much love and gratitude to you, Adam. If you want to become a fellow magician and follow in Adam's magical footsteps, check out the support link in the show notes. You'll help me deliver longer shows and more of them, and also a wider variety of shows. I have some ideas that are beyond what podcasts in this genre typically are, and I just need to free up some time in order to pursue them, and of course any support helps me in that endeavor. Regardless, I hope you enjoyed the chat with Tommy Kelly, and I hope each of you, whether novice or expert, find your own pathway in this magical, magical world that we're living in. That does it for this one. Please do tune in next week. Same occulted time, same occulted channel. R.I.P. Mr. West. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.